Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Hammer. I'm the Vice Provost at the University of San Francisco today. And uh, today I will be introducing our speaker, who is known, I think, to many of you, uh, Terrence Parr. Terrence Parr is the founding director of the uh, Master of Science in Analytics program at USF, which is now called the Master of Science in Data Science program. Uh, he's an expert in uh, programming languages, and most people know him as the for his work with the Antler uh, parser software. Uh, we have released him from uh, the nursing home for yeah. one hour yeah. today <laughs> to give us a talk on uh, decision trees. Uh, one of the things I really like about Terrence, and I, and I uh, extend to him as, as an authentic compliment, is it's very hard as a faculty member to make a, a transition in knowledge mid-career, and Terrence has kind of um, been learning um, as hard as he can, everything he can about data science for the past several years. He brings kind of a fresh perspective to bear a lot of the time, and his formidable skills as a programmer, and so I think you'll see uh, that in play during this talk. So let's welcome back uh, Terrence Park. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so today I'm going to be discussing work done with Prince Grover. Prince, are you here? Okay, former uh, master's in data science student here at the University of San Francisco. So, uh, so this whole thing started because I'm writing a book with Jeremy Howard, and I realized I needed to describe uh, how these random forests that we're using for the book, how they're actually implemented because it's important. So of course, uh, rather than just drawing a bunch of pretty pictures by hand, I decided that the right thing to do was to avoid real work and write some code to enjoy myself. So um, that basically led to the, uh, the topic today, which is the visual interpretation of decision trees. Okay, so started out with that library, it was 0 0.2, and uh, Janae here asked me to give a talk in the series to describe this work, and so I thought, okay, sorry, I'm gonna turn this down just a little bit. Okay, the down button makes it go up, awesome interface. See, I'm dissatisfied. Before we very eyes, I'm gonna reprogram the Raspberry Pi in here. Um, okay, so I started out with 0 0.2, and so I started writing this talk, and I realized that to appreciate the subtleties of the visualization, the, the elements the, uh, within this, uh, the decision trees, which are the result of training a decision tree, a classifier or regressor, scikit-learn, to appreciate the details, you really have to have a pretty solid understanding of the training process itself for decision trees. It occurred to me that the best way to describe how decision trees are trained is visually, so I, of course I went off to write some more software. What I'm saying is that I'm physically incapable of writing a talk about a library without making another library. <laughs> Ultimately, I will go back to the book. Um, so that of course led us to this, and then I'm gonna, uh, the, the 0 0.3, I'm gonna say something about the implementation because I think it gives you a window into the special brand of tenacity and insanity that's going on in here. Um, and then because there's a lot of students here today, I thought I'd give you a bit of advice about how to create things of beauty by being extremely dissatisfied. It makes you extremely annoying to be around, but you can have a very fulfilling life. Okay. So now, just so that we're all on the same page. Regression versus classification. Regression draws through the data draws a decision surface through the data, and classification draws decision services between clumps of data. So for example, here I'm trying to predict miles per gallon from vehicle weight. I'm going to represent all of that training data with a particular decision surface. The nature of these decision surfaces is dictated by the model I'm using. So I can use a piecewise linear approach here if I want. So within a particular region, I'll predict a linear uh, approximation to that data. Or I can have some really fancy curves that separate my data in this two-dimensional feature space here for classification. And just remember that once training is done, the result of training is the decision surfaces. All of that data gets blown away like the wind that took out all the smoke last week you're left with what is effectively a lossy compression of the original training data. I'm representing all of that 
training data by just a line. That's a tremendous compression. And it's lossy, but it's a good compression. OK. Now, I've always felt that the best way to learn a new technique or algorithm is to reinvent it. So what I'd like to do is reinvent decision trees before your very eyes. So we're going to play a little game. We're going to build a regressor, but you can only use horizontal lines. In fact, only one of them. So we're going to get kind of a crappy approximation here. I've got this line that goes across. And of course, if I'm going to minimize the error, in this particular case, the mean squared error, in other words, take these residuals, these deltas, square them, take the average. If I'm going to use that particular loss function, then the best approximation of a single line is the mean, the average. This makes sense, right? If I don't know the height of each basketball member, basketball team member, and somebody asks me the height of a particular basketball player, I would just guess the average height of that team, and that's a reasonable approximation. Of course, if I'm willing to take a piecewise approach, I can produce a much more impressive approximation. So I'm allowed to use multiple lines, still horizontal. It's just that I'm partitioning the feature space, right? The feature space is my vehicle weight here that I'm using to predict miles per gallon. So I'm partitioning feature space into regions of similar target values. So I'm trying to find regions where the miles per gallon are very similar so that when I approximate them with a mean, I'm going to get a very close approximation. And I can just make a whole bunch of these partitions, and I get a reasonable piecewise approximation here. Of course, where the, the details is where it all, it all matters, right? And where do we find these splits? How do we get these splits? That is what it comes down to. That's our big question. Well, we can just try one uh, on the left here, say at 2,000. And you can see that we've got pretty large residuals. This mean over here is a really crappy approximation to some of these values down here and up here. So it's a bad choice because the values in the subregions are not similar. Here's another choice. I can move to the other side. And once again, I have two subregions that I still have some pretty high residuals. So my mean squared error is still going to be pretty bad. And you can just think of this as the purity or the similarity in each region if you don't want to think about the mean squared error. OK. So boo, those are terrible. Now, it turns out that there exists a split point in this region that will give me the minimum squared error. Now, it may not be a good one, but it's still going to be there exists a minimum. So I'm just going to exhaustively try each x value in all these dots, I'll just start on the left and go do, 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 do. And for each x value, I'm going to compute the mean squared error. I'm going to track all of those values. And then the x coordinate associated with the minimum error is my split point. And so then my predictions would be the average of whatever's on this side and the average on that side. And so that's how I split one particular space. Now, in a divide and conquer strategy that you might be familiar with uh, from binary search and other sorts of things, once I've broken it into two subregions, I can break those regions into subregions, following the exact same procedure. So I started with one split, and I'm going to look at everything on the left and try to find a value in between 1,000 and S1 to see if I can figure out a good split point that is going to improve the error measure that I've got. And the same is true on the right-hand side. So the key is that I'm starting out and I'm recursively spreading out to partition this space into finer and finer chunks. So if you look at the tree of recursion, sorry, I'm a language guy. So this is the stack, as I call all these functions, right? Um, so I, I've just invented some function called split. And in the range, you know, 1,000 to 5,000, my entire range, I'm saying find the minimum, the split point associated with the minimum error that, you know, for two regions that have similar values. And it's going to give me some value. In this case, it was that. And then I'm going to say, okay, from the left side all the way to that split point, split that thing. 
similarly, from the split point in the middle, go all the way to the right and see what the split point is there. So this is how I'm recursively partitioning this space. And the result of training is this S1, S2, S3. Because all I care about for training is the partition space. Because then I know it's just some trivial piecewise horizontal lines. Now, you can recurse until you get a single sample in each uh, range. Probably not so good. You probably overfit like crazy. Uh, you can go until you reduce the overall error to something acceptable. You can go until a split doesn't reduce the error at all. In other words, the data is so pure that splitting it doesn't help at all, or the, just the nature of the data. So, um, but, so the results of these ranges, so I get a split here. So from the left, S2, and then from S2 to S1, these are the ranges, and the predictions are simply the average of all miles per gallon for samples in this range for the features. OK, so let's implement this thing. We're programmers. If I give you a set of regions and I tell you to make predictions, it's pretty easy, right? Now, I'm going to follow this in a particular order just to make it uniform. Um, I'm going to say if it's less than S1 and it's less than S2, it's this region. If it's less than S1 but greater than or equal to S2, it's this region. Um, and then I've got this region and this region. So a trivial set of you know, Python code, pick your favorite language. And then the predictions are simply the average of all the values in here, 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 and here. I don't like repeated computations. I don't like to waste computing power. So I don't like the fact that I'm constantly testing S1. What am I going to do? One of the first things you learn as a programmer is to factor, nest, uh, factor a series of if statements into nested if statements and removing all the redundant computation. So once I'm inside this if, I don't need to retest it for these. So this has dropped the number of comparisons maybe by half. So th this is fine, but do you really want to build these by hand? You don't want to really hard code these. Although it occurred to me when I was writing this talk that wouldn't it be interesting to make a code generator that generates a hard-coded random forest that would immediately just start up and be, there's no training, it's just a anyway, separate thought. Um, so we don't actually want to do this by hand, but you could have a program generated for you. All right. So as a compiler person, I know that that if statement was actually converted to an abstract syntax tree, or if you want to think about it this way, this is just a decision tree. So I'm testing for a particular split value. What is that, like 2,700 or something? And if a feature value coming in, the vehicle weight, I'm trying to test a vehicle weight. If it's less than 2,800 or whatever, I go this way. If it's greater than 2,100, I say predict that. So I've converted this. If you, if you took this thing and went and rotate it 90 degrees, you're going to get that, right? And notice that it also mirrors the recursion tree. So the recursion tree, when I trace that out in memory using the stack, when I'm programming, I can actually have a bunch of return values come back that are nodes in a tree. And so I can, you can imagine the relationship between the recursion tree and this particular tree here. So the internal nodes test feature values, the vehicle weight, and the leaves make predictions. OK, turning to classifiers now. So what you see here is a one-dimensional feature space. And all this is kind of like a cloud layer stratification strip plot thingy. All values at the same cloud layer are in the same class. So I'm doing uh, amino acid versus wine, the standard toy uh, data set. So all the values at the same level in the cloud layers here are of the same class. And so my goal is to split this feature space, the amino acid proline, so that I get pure subregions. So notice everything to the right of this first split is pretty much yellow. And it's kind of noisy on the left. It's uncertain. But it's the best I can do. I actually get a good reduction by splitting it here. And now I split it again on this side, because I'm absolutely pure yellow on this side and mostly yellow here. And then on this side, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can given the fact that I only have one variable. 
The process of training a classifier tree is exactly the same as training a regressor tree. The only difference is, is my loss function. In a classifier, I'm trying to say, hey, make everything yellow over here and everything green over here. In a regression tree, I'm trying to say, hey, make all these predicted values like the same, and these are all the same. So that's really the only difference is my loss function. So, and uh, instead of predicting the average, the mean in the leaves, I'm predicting the most common element. So in this case, yellow, yellow, green, and blue. So I'm predicting the mode and not the mean. Check my time. Okay, so obviously we don't have single variable data sets very often. So let's think about a two-dimensional problem. The idea here is, once again, that we're going to partition feature space. But now that I have two dimensions, it's kind of like a, a, a tessellation of this space. And I like the word tessellation, so I'm going to say it a lot. Um, so now the, the difference with two variables from one variable is the first, uh, with one variable, I say, find the value for, say, vehicle weight that gives me the minimum error. That's the split point I want. Now I'm saying find a combination of feature and feature value. So it could be that one variable is better for splitting than the other. And where in that feature space I split depends on the values in there. But so now I've expanded my search space. It's not just exhaustively testing feature values. It's exhaustively testing combinations of feature and feature value. So the model in this case has decided that it's going to choose the proline uh, amino acid as the feature to test, and this, this is the split point I want, because I get mostly yellow over here, and if you want, you can think of this, if you project all of these down onto this x-axis, you will see this setup here. So I get a simple tree that says, hey, if your proline value is less than this value of x1, then predict uh, blue wine, otherwise predict yellow wine. So, if we now allow the tree to grow bigger, it has the opportunity to compare or to look for another combination of feature and feature value. In this case, the model has decided that it's best to split in the other dimension, so flavonoids, whatever that is, sounds like a candy or something. Um, but so now we're splitting in the other direction. And what this allows us to do is to tessellate, to break up and partition this space. Imagine you're doing this by hand. You would just draw squares, right? I'm allowing you to draw wherever you want. The only constraint is they have to be perpendicular lines. Okay, and so obviously then I get this tree right here. I've got the, uh, a different feature being tested here and a different feature being tested there. And then I break it down into more pure regions. Okay, so here is now something two-dimensional in uh, regression space. I've got vehicle weight and horsepower now as features, trying to predict miles per gallon. So 3D kind of doesn't work unless it's in motion, so I wrote a little uh, thingy bob to, write an anim to make an animation. And so if you look straight down on it from the top, it's a heat map. But since they're not just you know, discrete colors, like three colors, it's a whole range of miles per gallon values. It's hard to kind of see what they are. So what we get in two-dimensional two -dimensional space, we get a heat map. In three-dimensional space, we get a series of plateaus, like Machu Picchu, right? the terraces. And so different regions will have different average values. So a little harder in uh, regression territory to explain that, but that's what it looks like. Okay, so now that we're all on the same page about how training occurs, hopefully you will appreciate some of the goodies in the trees that I'm gonna show you. So instead of these kind of trees, uh, I wanna show you an expanded version that will hopefully explain how this partitioning works. Okay, so we have a, the end result of training is this graph on the left here, our partition space. 
And if we look at the standard scikit visualization for the decision tree, all of our information is here. First of all, it's a tree. That's a good start. And it says, okay, I'm testing vehicle weight, and it's less than or equal to some split point. I go this way. If it's greater than this split point, I go this way. I test vehicle weight again, vehicle weight again, and here's the different split points. And then you'll notice that these are the same mean squared errors that I've been talking about, 19.1, um, or uh, sorry, the values here. These are the predictions. This is the average of the values in that region. This is the average of the values in this region, and so on. Um, it's not immediately clear to the casual observer what the color means. Um, anyway, so I became dissatisfied. And so uh, this is uh, the end result of what Grover and I put together. What you want to know, I mean, what is the critical thing that we're doing when we're just training a decision tree? We are breaking up a feature space according to target values. So your, the decision nodes should show you the distribution of that feature and the target value. So we start out with the entire range here for vehicle weight versus miles per gallon, and then we choose a split point. And notice that everything to the left of the split point is shown here. Everything to the right of the split point is shown here. So the key is to keep the same scale. So you can see how you're breaking up into finer and finer chunks, the feature space. And then ultimately, when we get down to the leaves, we have a strip plot that shows you something about the number of elements visually and the density of them and where they are in this space. Notice that this scale is the same for all of the target spaces. Again, it's for comparison purposes. You can see immediately that the predicted value here, this mean, is going downwards as we descend in this partition space. The same thing is true of these leaves. Let's look at two-dimensional classification space. So we have broken up the wine prediction space here. And we're getting the same visualization from scikit-learn. Now, this is probably derived from the implementation point of view. Because as I said, the implementation is, you know, is almost the same. It's just the loss function that's different. So it stands to reason that you would have the same visualization. I don't agree. The reason is, yes, they're implemented the same way, but we interpret the space quite a bit differently. What I want to know is how these values can be split such that I get a pure node. Now, notice that I'm switching variables, proline and flavonoids, so I'm not getting everything to the left goes over here. But you can see how once I've split off these guys, then this choice for flavonoids gets a very pure choice. I get to split right there, and I get to have a very pure uh, right-hand side represented by the pie chart. Now, pie charts are kind of the idiot boy of uh, you know, visualization, as I found out because Janae told me. Uh, or no, I guess it was James who told me. But um, the thing is, what I'm trying to get across here is something about size. And I agonized over the relationship in size between 8 and 59 for about three hours. And I found some weird expert of multiplied by log. Because you want to see the difference between 8 and like 13 as really big. But 1,000 and 1,000 and 13 is no big deal. Anyway, so I agonized over the function that proportionally shaped these nodes. But I, you'd want, at a glance, to be able to see what the most common, what, what is the vote that gets the most here. And so if it's mostly blue, I want to know. If it's all jumbled up, I don't care what their values are. I just want to see quickly that they're all jumbled up. And here you can see it's quite pure. So the other thing you may not notice is the height of this changes as the number of samples in that region goes down. Because often you want to know where the weight of your samples are going in the tree. If you get a whole bunch of nodes that are like these tiny little things, well, gosh, you probably overfit the crap out of that data, right? You zoomed in on the noise. What you really want are these big, fat, pure nodes. So all of this is coming into play. As an option, um, you can also do this sort of cloud layer stratification 
where you can see all of these different values at different heights. And let's see, yeah, again, we're doing in different variables, flavonoids versus proline, but um, I don't know, I kind of like that, I don't know why. But it's a, an equivalent representation. So the other thing you need to know is given a test vector, how does the tree interpret that test vector? In other words, why did I get the prediction that I did for a particular test vector? You want to see the decisions that were made based upon the values in this test vector. So as you descend into a decision tree, you are testing features dictated by whatever feature is indicated at these nodes. So this is a different, uh, this is a knowledge prediction, whether the person has high, low, medium uh, prediction or knowledge. And there's a number of features, which I can't remember what they are. Um, so you can see that I've highlighted the variables that were used for this particular prediction and highlighted the nodes that were used to get from the root through all the decisions into this particular feature vector. So then you can quickly see um, that, you know, where it ended up and why it chose these things because this value was greater than this and this value was less than that, et cetera. And also that the model is quite confident about that prediction because it's a pure, pure node. Okay, so all these visual cues are there to kind of help you with the interpretation. Okay, uh, so you've already seen these uh, because it's the first part of the talk. So part of the point three library that I pushed out a couple days ago, you can do all of these uh, partitionings that are the end result of what happens to the feature space. And that's quite useful for educational purposes. And it's possible even for a real problem. You'd like to know how a decision tree of a random forest, for example, is splitting up two of your variables. For example, you're doing apartment pricing in New York City. You'd like to know how longitude and latitude, how that feature space gets desolated. Uh, and as I said, you can have a heat map if you like, or you can have the 3D visualization, and then with the cursor, you can move that around using the standard uh, map plot lib. So as I said, it's, it's kind of hard to see what's going on here just from a two-dimensional thing, so it's better to make a little movie. Um, we have a plane layout if you want to see a bigger tree and you've, you've gotten some idea of the distribution of the various nodes, you're really more interested in knowing how a particular sample is run down the tree, then you can use the so-called non-fancy mode and it will tell you the variable that is being tested and the split point. So remember the result of training a tree is which variable and which split point. So you're exhaustively testing to find those two combinations. And of course, I, I don't show it, but you can have a left to right orientation if you want. So I think I've already mentioned a lot of these details, but the height of the stacked uh, bar graphs and other decision nodes changes depending on how many elements there are. So that gives you some idea of where the mass of samples are in a tree at any particular point. And we spent hours picking colors. I particularly like those colors. The problem is that they, if you get rid of these boxes around the bar chart, they wash out completely and you can't see them. And then the contrast is not there for uh, you know, less able uh, visually people. And um, so we put these little box or lines around them and they're hairlines and they're a particular color of gray. Um, Took us about three hours to figure out how to get that wedge underneath the graph. It was clipping the crap out of that thing. And uh, so let's see here. Um, and yeah, it took forever to figure out how to get these individual chunks out to draw boxes around them. But OK, and so then our, our target axes, you know, these are all the same things. So you can see the difference between two leaves. And we include all the information here. Um, and then the, um, the idiot boy uh, pie chart here. seems like we went down a lot of ugly paths. Most of it was trying to get the system to actually work. But um, once in a while, we got the opportunity to actually explore the visual elements. And I, you know, the, the stacked histogram, that's always tough, right? Because you don't know how wide to make the bar graph, or the, the individual bins. So the shape can look quite different. So I thought, ooh, maybe we'll do this kernel density estimate and I can impress the statisticians in our program. Uh, so I came up with this really awesome looking 
thing here. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And then I get to the leaves and I go, wow, look at this leaf. And I realize, oh crap, there's just like one value in there, two values. So it's approximating the density with a bunch of normals that it's adding together, right? So this is extremely misleading. And so we cut it out. Um, I also went nuts with bubble charts and uh, that insanity only lasted about an afternoon before I decided to jettison. But it also looks really cool. And by the way, half of this stuff is me beating Matplotlib into submission. Right? This is not like, oh, yeah, turn on bubble charts with Matplotlib. So originally, I had this. Uh, there's the X submission doesn't mean anything. It's just all the samples in the value or in the node and then what its value is. But Jeremy told me that was stupid. So I tried to do something else. He's like, what's this X here? Um, so I came up with this brain dead thing. I didn't sound like that. Yeah, he, he doesn't sound like that. But it's better to mock you with her. Um, so I was like, ooh, I can impress Janae if I use a box plot. And then I'm like, oh crap, how do I show the size? Hmm. All right, well then I'll just make another little thing and I'll make a nice candy colored thingy. Um, Sanity prevailed, and I ended up with a strip plot, because Jeremy said, hey, how about a strip plot? And so anyway, all I did was take this and squish it over here. And so now you get an idea of the density and, of course, the y value, but you don't have to worry about, hey, what's the x value? OK. Um, I believe I have some time, but I don't want to belabor the point. Um, let me, a couple of notes on the implementation. So the overall structure is using GraphViz. That's a you know, graph layout tool that gives me the overall layout of tree nodes. The individual nodes are all generated with Matplotlib. So in other words, as I've, I've got this big tree in memory, and as I descend through the tree, every tree node, I launch Python, uh, I launch Matplotlib in the background. It creates a graph, shoves it into a file, and then I use an import inside Matplot, uh, GraphViz to merge it all together. Um, we used a lot of HTML stuff inside GraphViz to you know, get fonts and layout. Endless, ooh, it's one pixel too far to the left, damn it. And then I'll work four hours to do something to move it over. Um, I'll get to the biggest headache, which was generating high quality graphics in a second. Um, it might be interesting if you ever need to traverse the trees coming out of scikit-learn. Um, they're built for performance rather than ease of traversal. And so I build a shadow tree, which is an extremely convenient actual tree data structure that overlays all the information and collects it uh, associated with the trees coming out of scikit-learn. So it could be useful to you. OK. So I generated decision nodes with matplotlib, and I generated ping files. And we all know that ping is a lossy compression format, and it's really not a vector graphic, it's just a bunch of bits. So I imported those into GraphViz and generated a ping file, and it was absolutely hideous. So I'm like, all right, I've got to have vector graphics. So I said, no problem, I can make matplotlib generate SVG files, which is this filthy XML format thingy that draws pictures. No problem. Go into GraphViz and say, import this SVG file. It says, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. <laughs> so insert a great deal of foul language, and many, many, many hours later, I finally figure out that there's a magic incantation required to install GraphViz with a particular set of dynamic libraries that are required to make this work. And you have to hop on one foot and you know chant. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. But I finally got that going. And then I realized, oh, man, I need the height and the width so I can tell GraphViz how big this node is. Damn it, now i got to go parse SVG files. So no problem. I ain't a fear to parsing. I'll go parse it. Great. Parse it. Hey, it's working. OK, cool. Then I noticed that the output of the overall program was a big SVG file that referenced all the little SVG files. So I don't have one big meta file. I have a file that references a whole bunch of others. So I can't just give you an image file. I have to give you a zip with all of the images. So I'm like, damn it. 
that's completely unsatisfactory. So, okay, no problem. I'll write my own code to merge all of these SVG files appropriately and massage all of their naughty bits in there. Okay, great, I've got that. Oops, the new thing I'm using to generate SVG out of matplotlib screws up the fonts. Damn it. Okay, I know. Let's generate PDF files, and then using another program, let's convert the PDF back to SVG. <laughs> Victory, right? Yeah, so then we had more font problems. Uh, and then it, it goes on, believe me. It goes on and on and on. And finally, I think I've got it all right, and I've got it all merged, and I have to throw away all the code that I wrote to do merging and all this, I got it all working. And then I pull it up in Jupyter Lab, and I'm like, hey, sweet, this really works. I pull it up in Jupyter Notebook, and it's not, it doesn't work. There's something wrong with their SVG viewer. So this is uh, <clears throat> to say something about tenacity, of which I will say a few more words. So uh, for the students and possibly others in the audience, I thought I would leave you with a bit of advice about how to lead a very fulfilling life at the cost of being extremely annoying to those in the blast radius. I encourage you to be very dissatisfied. You should be offended by bad software or you know, bad processes. Now, you don't have to get angry about it because then you'll end up like me, but you can still be dissatisfied. You should crave things of beauty. You should want to create things of beauty. Don't go, ah, it's a picture, it's a ping, it's fine, it's whatever. You should go to insane lengths to, to make it look right. My goal is really to try to make the world a better place as I go along, right? I'm just trying to move along, get some more libraries, come on, make it a better place. And that's just one of the parameters that I optimize. And it's okay to obsess about the details because that's the difference between some half-assed thing that kind of works and something that is, is pretty cool, right? So, you know, be the kind of person that wants to create something of beauty. And of course, you know, this is going to send you off on huge tangents, right? Like, I started out doing this book thing with Jeremy, and then I'm like, oh, I got to do this visualization thing. And then I got to, oh, and then I got to do this other library. It's been a, a long series of tangents, but uh, it's all worthwhile. So one of my rules is to never, ever, ever let the computer win. Because this is, you're either a penny in debt or you're a penny out of debt. There's two totally different philosophies there, right? You need to absolutely win every time, otherwise each time you're gonna lose confidence, okay? You want to grow in confidence. So there's a, a famous line by this insane guy from the 80s, and he said, why program by hand in five days, which you can spend five years of your life automating. 30 years later, here we are. Okay, but I finally got it. As of a couple years ago, I got it to work. Finally got there, and I was ridiculed uh, for the first 10 years, arguably, rightfully so. But then I finally caught up, and you know, here I am. I finally got the tool that I wanted back in the 80s, and then I was like, wait, where, where was I? Oh, right, I was doing neural nets back when you could have like eight neurons. <laughs> okay, great, on a 286 with like 60K RAM, hey. Uh, so now I'm back. Um, and if you didn't get the idea, I, I want to just point out just how ridiculously tenacious you have to be sometimes to beat the computer into submission. So I encourage you to be courageous. Slap that stuff up on GitHub. Push it out at PyPy. Have the courage to push it out. Try to write articles and blog entries. Make artifacts. You want the world to know that you've been there, hopefully in a good way. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, the programming community, although there, there are problems with our culture, one of the good things about it is that we're always trying to help each other with, with articles and libraries and, and things like that, right? So, um, but there's a, there's a reason beyond just helping the community. It's helping yourself. When the reason I wanted to write this book with Jeremy was I didn't know anything about machine learning. 
So I figured the best way to learn was to write a book about it because that's what it does is it exposes what you don't know. So I started with a blank screen because <laughs> that's what I knew. And uh, as I tried to write, I was like, ooh, I don't know that. So I got to go read. I got to go implement. I got to do things, right? So try to explain. If you want to learn anything, try to explain it to somebody else, whether it's you know, stuffed animal or the chalkboard. Try to explain it. It will expose the holes. So you might think, ooh, I don't know anything in the beginning. You don't. It's all right. Neither do I. But think about it. That's the vast majority of the world. They need to see these bite-sized nuggets that you can write at the beginning. It's only when you get to these, uh, when you get really sophisticated, you can write these really cool things, but, you know, a thousand people can read it, right? So the biggest market is for the little things you can write at the beginning. So go for it. And, of course, students, you know, that's how you're going to get the job. They want to see the artifacts you've got. Show me you can build something. So the problem we have here is that I'm talking about obsessing about details and uh, you know, creating something of beauty and working really hard on something, but you also have to finish. So there's a constant tension. You have to find the line for yourself wherever you feel comfortable, but ultimately you have to finish or it didn't happen. Right? You wouldn't believe how many people I know in this world who have a bunch of unfinished research, unpublished libraries, it's just it, just, it didn't happen, right? If a piece of software falls in the woods, did it, you know, did it, can you hear it? I don't know. <laughs> so I've made it my, one of my parameters to optimize my personality is completion. I, I had a guy working for me uh, ages ago, and he wasn't answering any of my emails. So I called him on the phone. I'm like, dude, what's up? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got like 20 windows up with a bunch of emails I unfinished to you. I'm like, okay, so I'll tell you what, you go to the first one, and you finish, and you hit submit. So it just, you don't want to be that person, okay? Uh, a lot of people ask me uh, about, you know, the open source world that I've been in for a while. How, you know, how do I make a contribution? Well, it's easy. Look for the pain. And... You're looking for a hole in the market. If you feel pain when you're trying to do something, fix it, right? That's how you're making the world a better place. And this is, what, this is the opportunity you're looking for, right? Like I was trying to draw visualizations for the book, and I didn't like the libraries I saw. And then when I'm writing a talk on that library, I didn't like the other stuff I saw. So I got to write another library, right? So look for holes in the market, and things will appear. And so just a bit of advice, you know, look at other successful projects. And I always like to get a name first, get a cool name and everything else. That's a detail, right? Um, but, you know, that may not be true, but I like to think it is. And so there's lots of stuff you can do, right? Um, I won't bore you on all those details. You, you, can, you can read that. But um, look at other successful projects and see what they've done. And most projects are sort of these uh, democracies. And I am what I hope is a benevolent dictator, at least uh, in the antler world. Um, you know, you might not like what I do, but it's going to be very focused, and um, I'd rather have a really good dark German rye than white bread, right? So that's fine. So uh, you can decide what kind of a, a leader you are on that project. Do you want to be a benevolent dictator or whatever? So George Bernard Shaw, uh, about 100 and some years ago, uh, which I, I've updated the quote for modern times, um, basically... The guy said, the, uh, the reasonable person tries to adapt to the circumstances around them. Only an unreasonable person would try to adapt the world to them. So all progress is done by unreasonable people. So I implore you to be unreasonable. So I'll leave you with some links. Uh, that may be useful to you. Um, the first one is an article on the, uh, the talk that you just saw. And uh, then, there, you know, the generally I've got this website. I'm trying to put stuff up. And then if you'd like to learn more about the decision trees and see an actual implementation, you can look at Jeremy's uh, Fast AI course. And, of course, if you're interested in our graduate program, there you are. And then these are links to the two libraries that I use primarily for this. So with that, I will take your questions. Thank you. I'll try to remember to repeat the question. 
How long did it take me to do what, the visualization or the parser? <laughs> the parser general. The visualization. Um, yeah, fortunately, that was not five or 30 years. I want to say that was like two months of uh, feverish uh, and hellish pounding on the computer. People wonder why I have a lot of tendonitis in my hands. Not because I type so much, it's just that I'm really angry. I'm like, <laughs> I do, do this a lot. Yes, is there a space constraint to the size of the tree or the size of the data set? Yeah, unfortunately. So this kind of is meant for educational purposes. Um, but uh, I actually managed to generate um, a, a pretty large tree that took a lot of time to just even render once it was constructed. But yeah, ultimately, you know, you're not going to send in 30 gigabytes of data into this thing. It'll just choke, unless you have a really beefy computer. Yes? Oh, random forest. What about random forest? So if you look at this tessellation, um, imagine what a random forest does is it's training, say, 100 trees, but on slightly different data sets. And so it's going to get a slightly different partition of the data. And if I overlay all these, I will get sort of some fuzzy boundaries here and here and here. And so that's what the result of a random forest would do. It's the aggregation of a number of these partitions smashed onto each other. And then the sort of a voting mechanism occurs to make that happen depending on regression classification. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>